Afterwards, part of this weekend's Book TV on C-SPAN 2. Youth Klassen talks about the controversy over the 12 cartoons depicting the Prophet Muhammad that were published in a Danish newspaper in 2005. She also discusses Yale University Press's decision not to republish the cartoons in her book. The Hudson Institute in Washington, D.C. hosts this hour 15-minute talk. <laughs> Good afternoon. Could everyone please take a seat? We're about to begin. I'm Nina Shea. I direct the Center for Religious Freedom here at Hudson Institute. And it's my pleasure to welcome everyone to today's uh, segment of our series on uh, lifting the theocratic iron curtain, examining the application of Muslim blasphemy and apostasy rules in the contemporary world. And today we are very uh, proud to be hosting uh, Jutta Klaassen, Dr. Jutta Klaassen, who is the author of the new book just out by Yale University Press, uh, The Cartoons That Shook the World. And we do have copies for anyone who wants to purchase them outside after the program. Uh, Dr. Klaassen is a professor of contemporary politics at Brandeis University, an affiliate of the Center for European Studies at Harvard University. She's the author also of The Challenge of Islam, Politics and Religion in Western Europe by Oxford University Press. Uh, Klausen recently received the Carnegie Scholars Award uh, last year for her work on Muslims in Europe. And moderating the program today is Zeno Baran, who is the director of the Center for Eurasian Policy and a senior fellow at the Hudson Institute. She is also an affiliate at Hudson Center for Islam, Democracy, and the Future of the Muslim World. Um, and uh, <coughs> Zeno is the editor of also a forthcoming book, The Other Muslims, Moderate and Secular, in which European and U.S. Muslims discuss their ideas about countering radical Islamism in the West. Dr. Clausen's book has been described as a detective story and a definitive account of the East-West encounter over the Danish cartoons. Uh, I agree, though, with the epiphenomenon of Yale University Press uh, uh, deciding to drop the plates of the cartoons and other um, depictions. Uh, the story actually continues. Um, Dr. Clausen has written a serious scholarly uh, book that's going to make, I believe, a, an important contribution to understanding uh, this development in contemporary history. Um, the issue really at hand are the limits of free speech in a pluralistic society. Should democratic societies censor because of fear, and if so, Fear of what? Possible violent backlash, uh, fear of giving offense. Uh, these, this book discusses and probes this issue as well as sub-issues connected with the uh, Danish cartoons. For example, what is the responsibility of Western governments to apologize for private speech? Can religion be critiqued by scholars but not ridiculed by provocateurs? What is the relationship between Middle Eastern states and European Muslims? Uh, what about the existence of and, and the discriminatory use of blasphemy laws in the West? Uh, what is the new, what the new role of instant communications in spreading information around the world, including disinformation? And there's a host of other uh, such issues. Uh, she seems to have left no stone unturned she has traveled widely in the writing of this book and has conducted innumerable interviews across a wide range of people. So um, I think that we are going to have a very rich discussion today about some of these issues. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Clausen. Okay. I, I want to... Um uh, thank the Hudson Institute uh, for inviting me here today and um, particularly thank uh, Nina Shear for the kind introduction and uh, Saina Baran for uh, commenting on uh, what I have to say, or which 
I hope um, I've learned a great deal from. I've long wanted to meet you, so it's terrific that I have the opportunity now. Uh, thank you also to the audience for coming here today. Uh, much of, uh, about my book has now become uh, wrapped up um, in the question about um, the removal of the um, insert with illustrations, uh, which showed um, the front page from the newspaper, the Danish newspaper, Jyllands Posten, um, uh, with the cartoons as they were printed uh, that day, September 30th, 2005. The illustration insert also included some other uh, illustrations that were all uh, connected to uh, chapter six in my book. Um, I will um, address some of the arguments um, uh, here today regarding um, uh, blasphemy and uh, the uh, complaints about um, the cartoons uh, on the p in the original uh, conflict. Uh, then I'll talk a little bit about uh, security risk uh, to the argument on the part of uh, Yale University uh, was that uh, reprinting uh, not just uh, the page with the cartoons but other illustrating illustrations uh, featuring uh, the Muslim prophet Muhammad uh, would, um, pre in the context of a book about the cartoons, would pose a serious risk of uh, violence and uh, possibly death. Uh, for those of you who have the book, you can uh, turn to the um, front, really, where there is um, a note uh, where the press explains, um, John Donald is the director of the press, explains his reasons. Um, and uh, I will just, for now, uh, briefly read my own statement. Uh, um, I do want today to really talk about the substantive issues uh, and move on, but I might as well just make it clear that um, I did agree to remove the cartoon page, um, and um, this is my reason. Muslim scholars, friends, and political activists and leaders urged me to include the cartoons in the book with the purpose of encouraging recent analysis and debate on the cartoon episode. I agreed with sadness to the press's decision not to print the cartoons and other hitherto uncontroversial illustrations featuring images of the Muslim prophet. But I also never intended the book to become another demonstration for or against the cartoons. And I hope the book uh, can still serve its intended purpose without the illustrations. Uh, the, uh, it, it is obviously um, a strange situation for an author to end up suddenly uh, becoming another chapter in one's own book. Uh, maybe this happens to novelists, but it doesn't usually happen to social scientists. So, uh, But in case you um, have um, <coughs> forgotten what happened originally, let me just briefly lay out some of the parameters of the original conflict. It is, in fact, almost to the date four years ago that uh, the page with the uh, 12 uh, uh, cartoons they're called, but really they are caricatures, uh, technically speaking, they are caricatures, um, of uh, Muhammad appeared in Denmark. Uh, within uh, the first week, uh, the uh, sources of uh, the groundswell of protests that occurred six months later in February and March 2006 were already in motion. Uh, a group of Danish uh, imams, uh, four imams from three mosques in Denmark, uh, met and created um, an action committee uh, aiming um, to uh, punish the newspaper uh, for sure. Uh, their immediate goal was to um, get back at the newspaper, but they also had ambitions uh, and about um, creating a new political situation in Denmark and they directed their complaints to the Danish government. At the same time, um, a group of ambassadors uh, representing Islamic countries in Copenhagen were meeting uh, uh, at a reception uh, for the end of Ramadan and um, decided uh, jointly to write a letter of protest also to the Danish government. They were not protesting the newspaper, in fact weren't even uh, really uh, just protesting the 12 cartoons, but uh, their concern was the tone of debate uh, regarding Muslims in Denmark, including some statements made by 
um, a minister, a cultural minister, a minister from um, Anders Fogh Rasmussen's government. Anders Fogh Rasmussen, the Prime Minister at the time, is of course, as you probably now know, Secretary General of NATO. Um, the um, eventually, within um, by by uh, October 25th, uh, the Egyptian government informed the Danish ambassador in Cairo that the government, the Egyptian government, um, intended uh, to um, uh, complain to the United Nations and. Um, about uh, the Danish government's failure to protect Muslims in, in Denmark. Uh, by December 7, 2005, a decision was made at a meeting of the Organization of the Islamic Conference, a, a 56 member state um, organization, uh, to um, promote a trade boycott uh, against Denmark. Uh, by, through January and early February, uh, religious authorities in the Middle East became involved, became aware of the conflict, uh, papers started writing about it, uh, and uh, by uh, February and March, the global demonstrations broke out. Those are the sort of basic parameters. Uh, the Danish, uh, on the Danish side, um, the conflict seemed to ebb uh, by early summer 2006. The, the, the relentless um, uh, protests and emails and statements um, ceased. Um, I will not uh, here actually go into any detail about my book. Um, I do document uh, this trail. The book is really mostly about what happened uh, from the day um, the cartoons were published and until uh, the demonstrations broke out in March 2006. It was always curious to me what uh, happened in that interim period uh, to turn uh, what was really a gag um, on the part of a provincial newspaper. Forgive me if there's anybody here who reads Julian's Post, but uh, truly uh, the paper is the paper that I read when I grew up in Denmark and I come from a um, farm family in the provinces and uh, that was a typical readership for the newspaper. Um, how can a newspaper with a circulation of 350,000 copies end up producing riots um, around the world uh, six months later? That was a basic um, uh, problem that I uh, dedicated my research to and, and um, um, I, won't spoil, uh, I won't spoil the excitement by telling exactly what I found out. Um, <laughs> I think uh, it is uh, important for, for, for our purpose here today uh, to just uh, briefly pay attention to some of the uh, consequences um, and the ways in which uh, the cartoons have become a template for acting out claims, not just about Muslims, but also claims about the West and what the West does and doesn't do and what Muslims do and don't do, and etc. Um, and for sure, uh, the cartoon episode has had some lasting consequences in the international relations system uh, in the sense that the United Nations um, Human Rights Council uh, passed a resolution already in March 2007 uh, to the effect uh, that um, uh, defamation of relig religious figures, which was a language that is, um, was a compromise, um, to make uh, um, the resolution in some measure neutral with respect to religions, but the resolution is really about making Islamophobia and defamation of the Muslim prophet um, uh, a human rights violation. We have in addition seen in February um, 2008, um, there was a sort of a mini, mini crisis when it was revealed in Denmark that a plot had been underfoot to murder uh, Kurt Westergaard, one of the cartoonists, um, and the Danish press got very upset, and there was another wave of solidarity reprinting of his cartoon, um, the uh, very um, the one cartoon that really everybody knows about, the one with the bomb in the turban. The um, the plot, in fact, uh, was not uh, in, by any means a new phenomenon, and it grew out of the same circle of uh, that actually had started the original protest, a mosque. Uh, in in uh, Aarhus, uh, the uh, city where the uh, newspaper's um, headquarters are located, and uh, this mosque is uh, 10 miles uh, across town. Uh, so at, at, in many respects, this was really um, a very local conflict that ended out uh, spilling out um, um, in newspapers all over the world and in the streets and in many countries. 
uh, the the plot had been um, the, the, the had the members of the the people involved, the three people involved in the plot had actually been under surveillance for a, a very protracted period. Um, so it wasn't as if it was any new development. It was just a belated revelation about what happened uh, originally. Uh, at the same month, uh, the Arab League, uh, also in February um, 2008, the Arab League passed new rules for that gave permission to send to satellite TV in those countries, uh, primarily directed against Al Jazeera, which was blamed for um, uh, spreading news about and actually was in some of the res uh, messages uh, accused of uh, showing the uh, blasphemous images, which um, to my knowledge Al Jazeera never did. Um, June 2nd, uh, Al-Qaeda bombed the Danish embassy in Islamabad, citing the cartoons as the reason. It should be said that Al-Qaeda is in the business of bombing, bombing embassies, and every time it bombs, and particularly embassy, they'll find some reason. Uh, they had recently bombed uh, the Norwegian uh, a delegation in a hotel in, in Kabul. Uh, as well is well known, uh, the Egyptian embassy has also been bombed by, uh, in Islamabad, has also been bombed by Al Qaeda. Um, but and so there's the violence, uh, there's censorship, and self censorship. Uh, those are some of the legacies of the Khatun conflict. Uh, a new framework for the international adjudication of uh, um, Islamophobia. Um, certainly a renewed legal definition of, defini of, of what the meaning of blasphemy and uh, speech restrictions. Uh, but I think also it is important um, to note that in some regard the cartoons have also become a Western soap opera. Uh, Muslims need not even participate in it for Westerners to um, start uh, getting concerned about what we can say and, and not say about uh, uh, about Islam, or uh, in September 2006, um, a Berlin opera performance was cancelled, uh, not based on any uh, active threat, um, but simply uh, in anticipation of a development along the lines with the cartoons. Uh, we have had uh, various um, acting out performances, almost I would describe them as happenings, in the manner of the cartoons. Uh, in July 2007, a Swedish cartoonist, Lars Wilks, um, set up some cutoffs um, portraying Mohammed as a dog, he called him, uh, Gerd Wilders and his uh, fitna in uh, March 2008. And much as I hate it, uh, to add it on, but uh, in some measure my book uh, is now part of this, this legacy. Now I should perhaps um, say that I started writing the book already um, when the conflict broke out immediately. So the book has been in production uh, for three and a half years. Uh, I signed up with Yale University Press at a very early time. Uh, we didn't write into the contract that the cartoons would be reproduced, but the uh, decision to publish the book uh, was uh, accepted and passed by the Publications Committee at Yale University with the understanding that the uh, pages, the page with the cartoons would be reproduced in the book. Uh, for sure, I had discussed how uh, we would go about uh, reproducing them, obtained rights from the newspapers to reproduce uh, the page, etc. So it has been part of our discussion from the very beginning. I wrote the book uh, because I felt that I was at a very a particular situation uh, as a Dane. Um, I certainly I knew the Danish side. Um, and um, had access to talk, uh, not just to the editors. And the, um, uh, I spoke with Kurt Vestergo uh, one day when I was casually visiting the uh, editorial offices um, in what is my hometown in Denmark, Aarhus. Um, but I also knew uh, one of the imams who was uh, leading uh, the protests in Denmark, Ahmed Abu Laban, who subsequently died. I had interviewed him as well as many of the other leaders of European Muslim associations in connection with my research for my previous book. Uh, so I, f I figured I could go back and talk to them about uh, their views. Uh, and also um, I uh, decided that it would be interesting for me to look at the cartoons as an example of the feedback loop between what goes on in Europe uh, with Muslim associations and the Islamic countries. So therefore, I went ahead and requested interviews with the Secretary General of the OIC, Dr. Ekimeledin Isanulu, 
uh, as well as with the Secretary General of the Arab League, uh, Amwa Musa, and with people from the foreign ministries uh, in, in, uh, in Cairo. Uh, everybody agreed to talk to me. The only people I did not manage to interview was the Danish Prime Minister, Anders Fogh Rasmussen, as well as the Danish Foreign Minister. So uh, they are the only uh, main actors in the whole conflict who are abs whose own words are not in the book. Uh, the book uh, proved very difficult to write uh, because uh, it, it was such a, 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 a things developed with such speed, and uh, many actors um, made decisions about a view what 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 uh, the goals were and their actions uh, really without full knowledge of what was going on. In part because of the speed with which uh, the the conflict developed. Uh, so uh, when I was writing the book, I felt that I couldn't write it as a regular history or like a regular theoretical political science text. So instead, I uh, used as a narrative device in the book uh, what I, uh, the Rashomon Principle, uh, which is from a movie from 1950 by Akira uh, Kurosawa. Um, and the, prin uh, the basic principle is that um, uh, the same event uh, can be shown from the vantage point of different actors. And when you examine uh, their views and the decisions about what to do, it becomes clear that people would look at the same facts but interpret them different and act differently. Uh, and uh, often we're poorly equipped uh, for understanding how, uh, what motives other actors had. Uh, so therefore, even though the facts were simple enough, uh, there was very, um, there was really no agreement, uh, no shared uh, goal about uh, what the problem was or how um, a resolution uh, could be found. And that pretty much describes uh, certainly the uh, diplomatic aspect of the conflict. Uh, but I should point out that the Rashomon principle for me in the book is not a causal explanation. It is not an analysis of what happened. It's a principle of narration. Uh, in, in reality, uh, the actors uh, acted, um, the Egyptian government was not really interested at all in Denmark or what was going on in Denmark. Uh, when I went to Cairo, the most common phrase I, I came across was, who cares about the Danes, but the Americans must understand. I said, hey, <laughs> what, if you don't care about what the Danes do, what's going on here? Uh, uh, so for sure, uh, the primary purpose there was to get uh, a complaint about uh, Westerners as vi uh, also uh, capable of violating human rights on the record. Uh, the uh, Imam coalition in, in Denmark uh, went abroad and sought for help, but their primary goal, goal was actually to fight among each other in part also about who should assume leadership and really represent uh, the authentic faith in Denmark. Um, the newspaper editors for sure had no idea that uh, the cartoons eventually would be splashed across uh, the internet and be the source of riots. Uh, they were focused on a much more local audience and uh, uh, had in fact uh, been engaged for some time um, in uh, action with, with um, a very heated dialogue, one might say, uh, with the, with the, with, um, uh, the uh, Imam coalition. So the question now is, so why did I want to stir all this up? Those are some of the most common email messages I get today. Why did I really want to stir all this up? Well, um, I did want to stir it up because that is what we do in academics, uh, the academics do, and I think that we have uh, the ability to do it uh, by using neutral languages uh, and um, um, sort of step back from conflicts um, and, and analyze it, but for sure, uh, I had no intention of uh, reinforcing bad perceptions on every side um, of the conflict. But I did want to address some m major mi misunderstandings, and one of those major misunderstandings regards blasphemy and the concept of blasphemy and how it applies to the cartoons, uh, the page with the cartoons. Um, in fact, uh, a plurality of European states do have blasphemy prohibitions on their, on, on their books. And although the laws have not been enforced for many years, when European Muslim associations claimed that uh, it should be possible to make the cartoons actionable within existing law, they were not altogether wrong. Uh, the, 
but the issue was that many uh, courts and judges, and that certainly was uh, um, clear in, in, in the education that did ensue, were very poorly equipped for even discussing the concept of blasphemy in Islam. And then there's the issue about what is blasphemy in Islam. Uh, it has, um, on the part of uh, uh, some people at Yale, and I will, one of the uh, people who uh, have uh, been very critical of, of what I have done uh, at Yale is a professor of um, Islamic studies at Yale, Marcia Inhorn. And um, if uh, she came along uh, for the meeting I had with the secretary of Yale University on July 23rd, um, the meeting with uh, Linda Lorimer um, and Marcia Inhorn, uh, did not speak at that time, but she has since written at Yale uh, Alumni Magazine's website that um, uh, she, in the over 25 years of traveling um, in the Middle East, have never ever seen any pictures of either uh, Muhammad or uh, Ali or any other depiction, and uh, thus showing the offending cartoons uh, were not only superfluous um, to my argument, but would also for sure uh, offend Muslims and cause violence. Um, a violent outcry against the cartoons uh, would be inevitable, as he concludes. Uh, and um, those who understand Middle Eastern cultural sensibilities and who hope to promote cultural understanding and interface dialogue should certainly understand why publishing a book with many offensive contemporary historical portrayals of the Prophet Muhammad and Ali would be a major mistake. It is bound to offend the world's Muslims and beyond that to provoke a violent and potential deadly reaction. Um, She's also upset that I'm not grateful uh, to Yale University Press for publishing my book, and she doesn't think that it should have been published in any case. Um, fortunately, she was not one of the academic reviewers on my book. Um, the um, uh, issue, as it was presented itself in Europe, uh, was in fact not of uh, religious uh, prohibition, um, but was uh, always a question of Islamophobia. Uh, from uh, when I spoke to the Secretary General um, of the OIC, Ekemenlidin Isinulu, uh, he said, depiction was never the issue. These pictures are Islamophobic. Uh, for sure, that was uh, what most of, so in fact, for, on the part of most Muslims, it was a highly secular complaint. Uh, the complaint that these were blasphemous and showed uh, the sort of things the infidels uh, will do emerge at a much later stage in the conflict. They emerge only uh, when the violent rioting broke out and when the religious, some religious authorities but came involved. But mind you, uh, even uh, the Middle Eastern religious authorities never at any point issued any fatwas about the cartoons. Uh, it was instead an issue that became uh, the subject matter for the uh, manipulation of extremists. Um, uh, to sh and, and by that time, um, the, uh, the protest became directed not really against the Denmark, but uh, as part of an anti-Western protest in general. The security issue then. So for sure, uh, my own statistics in the book have been cited by Yale University as a reason uh, for not uh, including the illustrations. Um, 200 deaths were uh, associated with the cartoons as if that was not coarse enough um, to suppress the illustrations. Um, the, there was the additional worry that um, articulated by uh, John Necroponte, the director of uh, National in, uh, Intelligence, former ambassador to the United Nations, who said that um, in his um, statement, he said that the issue uh, was not a um, threat on the campus of Yale, uh, more of a, a generic concern um, about what might happen, say, in the streets of Kabul, uh, is how John Necroponte put it in an interview with a student newspaper the Yale Daily News. Um, he and a number of other experts uh, who were brought in um, by Yale University uh, as consultants, um, generally speaking, cited uh, the issue um, as of security. 
as something something that might happen uh, abroad, um, not uh, to Yale directly uh, or in New Haven, uh, but uh, that reproducing these images uh, would harm um, American interest, perhaps, uh, but certainly uh, set off uh, violent reactions. Um, much as I would love to see people buy academic books in Kabul and uh, <laughs> northern Nigeria, I really don't think it's very likely. Uh, I go to great length in the book to um, explain that the violence associated with the cartoons was not a matter of Muslims rising up spontaneously because uh, there were bad pictures going around uh, on the internet or um, uh, cartoonists making drawings in Denmark, but rather because the cartoons became wrapped up in the general narrative of all of the bad things Westerners do, and um, the deaths uh, were associated with local conflicts, uh, spots, hot points of conflict where uh, radical Islamism and extremism is already in the business of uh, agitating um, in uh, this way. And for them, the cartoons became another, another tool, uh, another issue. And that remains the case. So uh, the question then um, comes up, should we, uh, as um, academics working in this field, be concerned about what might happen on the streets of uh, um, say Kabul or in northern Nigeria in Kano uh, or elsewhere, uh, Tripoli, Libya, which was another place where uh, an appreciable number of people got hurt or died in protest uh, in the context of the cartoons. Um, I admit I do not believe so. Uh, I, we are not presently at war. Um, we, even if we were at war, um, I, I would agree that uh, with the, those critics of, of the press and the univer Yale University who has said uh, that this is um, anticipatory prior, uh, or prior restraint um, and uh, as um, Gary Nilsson from the Association of University Process uh, Professors put it, uh, this is a an instance of government censorship by proxy. I think that's a strong statement, uh, but I do think some principal issues have been raised uh, by what happened. Uh, people ask me, do I think that I have been censored? And honestly, I do, not, uh, I do not really feel that way because as an academic, I'm used to not really being able to say things exactly how I want to say them. It is for sure rare for an academic to be able to put illustrations in a book. Um, many people in my field are quite used to having to make do with uh, black words on white paper when we want to make our points. I do think that the First Amendment issue comes up in a different context. It comes up in the sense of the loss to my readers. Because what I intended to do by, by including the illustrations in the book, including the cartoons, was to offer the reader an opportunity to put on different glasses and go through uh, the arguments as they were made by different people in the conflict, by the cartoonists, by the editors, by the Danes in general who read the cartoons in one way, uh, but also by religious Muslims who did see them as blasphemous and libelous, um, religious extremists who regarded them as uh, evidence of um, the things Westerners do. Uh, but also secular Muslims um, who uh, in Europe uh, in general, but also across uh, the Middle East, uh, were really upset because of the cartoons attributed violence and the tendency to engage in violence uh, to the faith rather than to a political movement uh, which Muslims are um, the first victims. Um, I have uh, the opportunity uh, to briefly show the illustrations, and I will do that now. Um, I should say, though, uh, that one of the things that has been very important for me is to never have these images become <coughs> detached from the story that I'm telling. So um, I hope uh, that you will now look at them 
in the spirit of uh, what my instructional purposes uh, were uh, for the book. Let's see if this works. Okay, so this is the page as it appeared in the newspaper original. Um, one of the uh, interesting aspects of this uh, that was lost in the general debate is that several of these uh, images, in fact, barely uh, even attempt uh, to show uh, Muhammad. The headline, uh, the face of Muhammad, signals the intents of the intent of the newspaper editors. They did intend to provoke. Uh, they didn't intend to provoke the world's Muslims, but it was a cartoon editorial intended for Danish debates. It was a reflection on some recent events that had happened. I am uncomfortable uh, with some of these images in part because I regard them as anti-Semitic. Uh, if you look um, at uh, the cartoon up on the top um, with uh, the green star in the eye, uh, you will recognize the facial depiction of the Muslim prophet as essentially that of an Arab, uh, which is a classical European way of using uh, uh, physical features uh, to portray um, political intent, as was the case in, uh, with anti-Semitic uh, cartoonism and caricature in, um, throughout um, 20th century European history. Um, in fact, uh, one of the cartoons down on the bottom makes fun of the newspaper editors uh, it is uh, a boy scribbling on the blackboard um, in Arabic. Um, it's in Farsi, I'm told. I cannot read it. But uh, it says, uh, the editors of uh, Ulan's person are a bunch of reactionaries. So in this case, a joke was on uh, the newspapers. And several of them, arguably the one in the middle, also shows Muslims as victims. Uh, it's a mugging scene. And uh, the victim says, hmm, I can't actually really identify him. Uh, the argument has been made that we should look these up uh, on the internet. Uh, but uh, if um, we do so, you will find that many of the translations of the captions are not quite accurate. Uh, you will also uh, see that um, some of my purpose um, is lost because you can't read them. Uh, this is um, one of the death threats uh, that was um, received um, by um, the editors in Aarhus. Uh, they got um, thousands um, of, of this kind. This one I, I selected because um, it's in English. Um, and uh, chances are it doesn't even come uh, from anywhere in the Muslim world. It's probably produced somewhere in Europe. Uh, certainly, uh, many of the uh, death threats uh, turned out to come uh, be very local. Um, and some were sent up by men the usual mentally disturbed people who always uh, get involved uh, when there is um, a controversy. Uh, this is um, a, a death threat uh, as PowerPoint presentation. Um, <laughs> You have to uh, I like the graphics. I thought the graphics were. <laughs> <laughs> uh, this is um, an illustration of, um, that plays some role in uh, my book. Uh, it uh, is a depiction of a scene from Dante's a divine comedy that is called Muhammad's Torment. Um, it has uh, been reproduced in Western art in many ways um, by many artists. Um, I am sure it's offensive to Muslims. Uh, however, most people look at it and never know what it shows. Uh, it, uh, I have found it in antique bins walking up and down High Street in Oxford. Um, it was very often reproduced um, and put up on walls. In, um, uh, it was made by a Frenchman, Gustave de Ray, who uh, had a brisk <coughs> business in producing such pictures. Um, this is uh, the front cover uh, to a biography <coughs> of uh, Muhammad produced by, for children, written by a Danish children's book author. Uh, it is, uh, the illustration is a copy of a well-known Persian miniature showing uh, the heavenly ascent of the prophet from, uh, from the Dome of the Rock um, and the nightly journey. 
uh, in the original, which was recently exhibited at the British Library as part of an exhibit on sacred text. Uh, the face of Muhammad is uh, veiled in the way uh, that uh, became common uh, sometimes, uh, sometime around the 15th and 16th century in um, Islamic art. And this is uh, a typical Ottoman illustration which um, shows uh, Muhammad, uh, Muhammad's army, uh, the fight um, uh, uh, just before the, the take of, uh, of Medina. Uh, this is um, uh, a typical example really of the illustrated uh, manuscripts uh, that always show uh, the prophet uh, with his face obscured. You'll see the white veil um, from this period. Uh, as well as um, really uh, is, is um, biographies of, of the deeds of the man uh, as a lawmaker and um, as, as uh, a statesman. Uh, it's, uh, the tradition uh, has not been one of depicting, of course, uh, the, the, uh, the revealed word or, or, or in, in any other way depicting the religious aspect, but the reality is that um, this art uh, is now available in many museums, including museums, the Smithsonian here in D.C., um, and uh, to remove it uh, from books uh, such as mine uh, does violence um, to uh, the history of Islamic art. But it also becomes an obstacle not just uh, for um, those of us who can go to museums and see the art, but also for my students in my class, if I can't show it and discuss it, how can I highlight the differences between what the cartoonists were doing and uh, what uh, Muslims might reasonably expect with respect um, to the portrayal of um, their prophet. So, thank you. How do you understand? Um, this was a great, very rich uh, presentation. Um, I don't want to take too much time, but uh, maybe I will say a few, a few things. Uh, there's not much I disagree with. It's a great uh, book that, uh, and great work that you've done because uh, most people in America have never heard of this controversy. Um, I'll, I'll maybe say a few things about uh, how I came to this issue. Um, when I um, saw the original cartoon crisis uh, start, uh, my first uh, reaction was that uh, the newspaper was uh, quite naive in not understanding how this issue was going to be really taken up by the Islamists and really used. Because um, when I was um, researching for my um, monograph on an, another an is radical Islamist group, Hezbollah Tahrir, in about 2003, I was really surprised that they had picked Denmark as one of their main countries where they would radicalize Muslims. And I was thinking, why Denmark? It's not that you know, prominent in terms of, you know, I mean, you could talk about uh, Germany or UK in terms of foreign policy issues, in terms of history, but there were some of those radical imams uh, that were affiliated with, and, and you didn't mention it now, but it's, it's in your book, with Muslim Brotherhood or, or Hezbollah Tahrir, you mentioned and uh, the Imam um, Abu Laban who, who died. Um, and uh, one of the things that I never understood was some of these radical um, uh, self-declared community leaders were actually consulted by the Danish government uh, as uh, engagement partners uh, in terms of dealing with uh, terrorism issues. And, um, and then these same people then really took the cartoons and then shopped it around the Middle East to established leadership um, of over the other Muslims in, in Denmark. And we've hosted here Nasser Kader, who was one of the uh, most um, more outspoken people, and said, not in my name. Who do these you know, uh, imams represent when they go shop around in, in uh, different Middle Eastern countries, uh, mostly to basically say, look, in, in, in the West, in Europe, in Denmark, we're faced with Islamophobia. And the way for us to really fight it is that you give us money, you give us support, so we can silence these kind of um, Islamophobic um, statements. And, um, and I think as far as you know, Yale's decision um, and 
an American newspaper is not publishing the cartoons. The, the question I always have is that, is it out of respect for people's uh, uh, beliefs and people's sensitivities, which, is, which makes total sense, uh, but, or out of fear, which uh, does not make sense to me, because if, if the West, if in America, if in America uh, people are going to be silenced out of fear, then, then stop asking for you know, moderate Muslims to speak up. Because if Yale or American newspapers are afraid of violence or, or uh, you know, strong reactions, then what do you think you know, Muslims live uh, every day when they try to speak up against the radicals? And, and I deal with this issue all the time because I'm also um, working in these areas. And I find it, frankly, um, insulting and patronizing in, in many ways that when, um, when you know, in the West, in America, Denmark, most part, parts of Europe, Australia, people say we don't want to offend Muslim sensitivities, so we are not going to uh, deal with certain things. Now, maybe the cartoon issues particularly um, uh, became more than, than it, what it should be, but what, what that does is really selling out the, uh, the real um, truly integrated Muslims who are on the same side. And you, you said, we're not at war. But you didn't say with whom or, or what. Um, I would say we're at war. Um, and, and on one side are the people who are um, in favor of freedom, uh, tolerance, civilization, uh, mutual respect. On the other side, we have people who will kill you to silence you if they don't like what you're saying or what you, um, you know, they, they, so, so so there is something going on, and I would say most Muslims are on the side of most Westerners. So it's not a war between cultures of civilizations. It's a particular mindset, and that mindset, unless it is challenged, uh, again, I'm not saying the cartoons necessarily are the way, but it has become that. Unless it is challenged, I don't think uh, cultures or people really self-reflect. And um, that's something that I think with, uh, you mentioned also Garrett Wilders uh, and the cartoons, what it has forced uh, some Muslims to do is to really uh, look at the mirror. Because what was the, you know, we come back to the intention. You mentioned your intention was, was good. Uh, in a way, in, in these debates, intentions don't matter because when radicals get a hold of the agenda, they don't care. They don't want to hear your explanation. They don't want to hear about the intention. And what we have now is a really an international campaign to silence any form of um, criticism of what is done in the name of Islam. And uh, my problem usually with um, the, those who say, you know, we should uh, we should prevent people from saying anything that could upset that that uh, that is uh, that's going to be perceived as insulting Islam is uh, why is there more concern about X person criticizing or highlighting a particular thing and not what Muslims are doing in the name of Islam. And uh, I know um, these days it's no longer popular to talk about these things, but there are, it, you know, start from Al Qaeda to many of the people that, you know, in these countries that get so emotional about uh, some silly cartoons. Um, they don't really say anything or do anything when you have or when, when there are. Um, terrorists or radicals who say, you know, I'm going to kill you because that's what my religion tells, tells me to do. Um, and we have honor that mattering more than other principles. And that's something I think people need to really start to understand. At the most extreme case, we know about honor killings. But in less extreme cases, people will do anything for honor. And so the, 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 the sense of um, um, criticism or the, the, is, is not really no longer present in most of the Islamic cultures. It used to be there, and satire was, uh, was a, a big part of, of these uh, cultures. But unfortunately, more and more, people are basically saying, I don't want to look at the mirror. I just want you, and, and one of the um, um, threats that you said, you must respect Islam. Well, you, those people are making it harder for Muslims like me, because people will never respect. Uh, if you say you're forced to respect me, that does not ever lead to respect. That may lead to speak, you know, not speaking about certain things or, or being careful, but that does not ever lead to respect. And unfortunately, many of the leaders, many of the um, men and women in leadership positions 
um, are so focused on keeping the image of uh, Islam and enforcing other people than really addressing, you know, why do people perceive Muslims as angry and hateful and, and radical people? One of the recent experiences I've had is that just about uh, last, uh, 10 days ago or so, I was in Italy um, uh, and under the, they are now the G8, uh, uh, have the G8 leadership and uh, I was participating at a conference on uh, violence uh, against women, international conference, and uh, it focused mostly um, on Africa and, and Middle East uh, issues. And um, many of the issues related, unfortunately, to what people do, again, in the name of Islam. Um, and, uh, and many of the uh, women uh, who were Muslim were saying, you know, this, is, uh, this shouldn't, this is wrong, obviously, and trying to get help from West. Um, and, and these were mostly um, defenders of uh, women's rights as, uh, as human rights, as universal human rights uh, issues. Uh, we've had, uh, you know, speakers, for example, from Egypt, and this is mostly women, uh, saying that, well, you can't mention Islam in the same context as, you know, these horrible things that, that we're uh, describing from uh, domestic violence to, to killings to, to other things. Um, and they were mostly concerned about just removing any mention of Islam. And, uh, and then there were people like me and saying, well, how are we then going to really address these issues if we're only dealing with the symptoms? But not to, you know, dealing with what, um, you know, people do. We're never going to be the, the really resolving these issues. And one really culture clash um, that we have had was um, uh, one woman who came from a Middle Eastern country um, was going more and more agitated throughout the conference because uh, some of the Italians uh, were uh, actually saying the word Islam and some of the violence is done in the same sentence. So she kept coming up to me and saying, you're a Muslim, silence him. Tell him that he can't say these things. He's, he's, he's insulting Islam. Well, I said, well, but he has a right to speak. And you're, you have a right to be upset about it. And when it's your turn, or you can ask to make a comment, then you do that. She said, but you can't do that. We can't allow people to say these things. And then I was saying, well, see, his intention was not to insult Islam or Muslims, but actually trying to help by saying that so many women, half of the population, so many women are suffering. Not all women are beaten or killed, but there's a lot of um, oppression and repression going on. And by not speaking about these things, it hurts women, Muslim women, more than uh, anyone else. So we deal with this uh, issue of, uh, of cultural uh, maybe lack of understanding and and one of the things that I've observed um, in government engagement programs or um, meeting you know different uh, religious communities or academics even uh, meeting is that um, in the effort to find common ground people are not addressing the real issues and then we end up with these crises that seem to come out of nowhere but if you look at how the um, Islamist uh, infrastructure has, uh, has really established itself to really take advantage of any of these issues, and, and when you know, you're the whole Yale publishing the cartoons or not, that probably is not, in a way that what um, Ambassador Negroponte said is right. And it shouldn't be right. And people in Kabul will never read the book. I wish they would, too. <laughs> but if Yale published it, um, I'm sure that the same people who made such a big deal out of it would have made sure that the radicals in Kabul would, would find out that. And, and, and I can see the headlines or the, or the preachers saying that America is insulting Islam even under Obama. That would have been, you know, basically the, the uh, interpretation, not about Yale, an independent publication, not about you, what you try to do. So, and, and we have to deal with this issue because if um, freedom of expression uh, is going to be coming under threat because of what happens in Kabul or, or Darfur or other places, then we might as well give up. And um, so w with that, I'm sorry that I spoke more than a few minutes. Maybe, not maybe, but we'll open up for uh, questions, comments. And uh, if you can please introduce yourself and wait for the microphone over there in the back. Yes, please. I don't know if there is there a microphone. I, don't, I probably don't need a microphone. Yeah. 
when you said that at a certain point, I thought you said in yeah. 2003. Could um, you identify yourself, please? I just, I'm a person here. Okay. <laughs> um, that a certain group had decided that Denmark was a place where a radical agenda could be pushed. Do you think that meant that they were waiting for a pretext and the cartoons merely provided that pretext? Who's the, it, um, like it's to me? Yes, I don't want to mispronounce your name because you were the one that said that about sure. Denmark. Sure. Um, I think based on what I've been observing with uh, the radical Islamists, they're always waiting for a pretext. They get ready and then anytime they find something, they jump on it. And this became a perfect pretext for them. And it, they took their time, right? It was, it was after a long time when the original uh, pieces were published and then um, they, they became organized. And I would say that um, some of the imams are not just sitting in, in Denmark and deciding on their own, but they're consulting with their partners in the Middle East or other places. And then they probably decided that this would become actually a very good fundraising and uh, issue raising opportunity. But you disagree. <laughs> Yes, I mean, Hizbut Tahir didn't have much of a role originally in this conflict. Uh, Hizbut Tahir um, did organize together with Al Muhajirun um, a particularly unpleasant demonstration in uh, London in February 2006. Uh, but originally, when the, um, uh, the Imam Coalition and Mosque Coalition got together in Denmark right after the uh, cartoons had been published, it, it was really just that these were the four uh, imams who were the most prominent and, and, and leaders of these communities. And between the four of them, there were a lot of disagreements. Uh, what was interesting about uh, the, what was going on was that it really um, fit the usual description of sect development of sectarian politics. You try to outcompete the other person by being more radical. Uh, but the, the, the one was particularly important was uh, a person from uh, uh, from Lebanon uh, named Khayet Khalal, uh, who is back in Lebanon and is associated with with a radical uh, Sunni extremist group there. And for sure, you're right. He did have communications and contacts, and it was a transnational network. Um, um, that he used to spread the news and uh, the <coughs> information went back and forth in that network. Gentleman there. Stuart Reuter. While you were speaking, Dr. Glasson, I came up with an analogy that might illustrate the problem with Yale. Had you been writing a book about the origin and verification of the Shroud of Turin, and they then told you <coughs> you couldn't have any pictures <coughs> of the Shroud in your book, uh, would the reaction be the same? And for Ms. Barron, where are these moderate and sectarian or secular Muslims? Uh, we never hear about them. My, well, I, I said it in my, you know, three, four minute uh, comment, I guess, is that um, the reason you don't hear about them is because um, many people in the West are um, s too afraid to speak up themselves. So the moderate Muslims, basically, either when they speak up, there's no coverage, there's no media attention, there's uh, very little interest in what they're saying, or they look at the winds, and the wind seems to be blowing on the side of the, on the direction of the Islamists. The governments and, and uh, publications are more interested in hearing their views than the real moderate Muslims. And um, that's one of my attempts with uh, my upcoming book that, that Nina mentioned, is to give voice to some of them um, so that uh, people like you will be able to uh, hear, hear their views as well. But they're there. Um, if anything, they're either scared because they see that everyone else is uh, uh, caving in to fear. So why stick your neck out when there is not even your Western government that might support you? Or they're really trying hard, but there's no money, there's no support, and uh, that's where we are. I think I agree with you. In some measure, my book actually contradicts what you just said. Um, I uh, do be, uh, describe 
uh, what the complaint was on the part of most European Muslims, and for sure it wasn't uh, a complaint uh, about um, uh, uh, religious offense. The term blasphemy was used in an entirely secular legal uh, concept. Uh, it was much more an effort on the part of uh, religious association, religious based groups, which I think uh, we have to agree are a le legitimate element in society, be it Muslim or not, or Christian. Uh, but European politics have always been shaped by such groups, and uh, that's why there still are blasphemy enforcement going on in Europe. Uh, the uh, French court in 2005 um, penalized a French jeans maker for. Um, uh, having an advertisement for the jeans that um, uh, emulated um, the Last uh, Supper. Uh, there have been many instances like this. Uh, they, um, and uh, when, when the religious Muslim groups uh, made uh, complaints about blasphemy, they were merely trying to use existing laws for their purpose, arguing that we are religious people and like other religious people, we have a right to equal protection under the law. Now, I'm personally opposed to blasphemy laws. I do think that they are an unfortunate restraint on speech, but that's because I may be European, but I really become quite Americanized. Um, in Europe, the sentiment is uh, a different one. Uh, and uh, I, I do not uh, think that uh, many, many people I spoke with and I interviewed in the book would argue that Muslims were misunderstood. I think that is the most common phrase I heard, uh, that their opinions were misunderstood in part because of the way the media reported the crisis originally. Every time there was any discussion about uh, demonstrations against the cartoons or statements or this and that, because um, the media decided that it wasn't mostly decided that it wasn't going to show any pictures of the original images, but rather instead invariably any decision uh, to have uh, an illustration involved putting a picture of demonstrating Muslims burning the Danish flag up. And still uh, the coverage in um, uh, my book um, has brought the same st um, uh, images up. Uh, there have been no Muslim protests against my book, and yet uh, coverage uh, of uh, Yale's decision to remove the illustration from my book has been, on a number of occasions, uh, accompanied by pictures of angry Muslims burning the Danish flag or setting things on fire. And I do think that's a misrepresentation. Dr. Clausen, I have a question. Oh, sorry, I'm, I'm Alexander McLaren from the State Department. Yeah. Um, what exactly made the cartoons so provocative? There are a great many ungodly things going on in the world each day. Why these cartoons, of all things? Um, and did you feel that it was more, well, I guess some light has been shed on this. You feel there was more a top-down um, process that people chose these cartoons chose to get word out about them to inspire, to inspire violent demonstrations? Is that more or less correct? What was really remarkable about the cartoons was the extent to which people had knowledge of them, but didn't know them, didn't actually see them. Uh, uh, Pew, uh, the Pew surveys uh, did uh, found that uh, on, in a 13 country survey that 80% of the public knew about the cartoons, a figure that rose to 90% in Jordan and Egypt as well in, in some Western European countries. Americans were not so well informed about this whole matter. Um, I thought that was really a puzzlement. And uh, it wasn't, uh, so I, uh, as part of my, uh, my, my interviews, um, I had, um, I'd, I'd asked people what uh, it was that was so upsetting. And it became clear that for most Muslims, the, mi mis the Muslim middle class across very wide swaths of the Middle East and Europe, um, I can't speak about Pakistan because it's outside um, my expertise, uh, for sure was personally offended. Muslim diplomats I spoke with thought that those cartoons were just really, really nasty. And uh, the sense of hurt was uh, a double-barreled one. It was really uh, mostly people who are uh, uh, 
not, there wasn't Salafists uh, who were the most upset. Salafists said, well, of course, this is the sort of things. Um, I mean, what's the difference between cartoons and pornography? It's the same thing. Or, or, but it was a, a brand of Sunni Islam where uh, the biography of the prophet is really a personal model. It's a, it's a, the, the prophet represents love and peace, and, but also moderation. And uh, many Muslims seek to, uh, there's a tremendous upsurge in, uh, um, you know, many books, biographies, new biographies written about uh, the prophet and his life and his doings that are sell briskly. Um, and this is a very important aspect of the um, modernization of Islam for the middle, pious middle class, uh, as well as going, of course, on, on the Hajj to Mecca. Um, and as uh, in particularly in Europe, when immigrant origin families are starting to accumulate more money, uh, the sort of uh, Islam that they are articulating for themselves now is really an ethical Islam, uh, and uh, and that focuses a great deal on the Prophet's life and doings. And uh, the cartoons suggested that the Prophet was the reason for the violence, and that was uh, just considered at the same time blasphemous but also um, an insult against, uh, against the faith. Um, so Muslims read uh, these cartoons in a very different way. Um, the Danes thought that they were just merely doing an anti-clerical drawing the same way they would have drawn uh, you know, the Pope. Um, and I think that gave a lot of raw energy uh, to the conflict. But the knowledge about it was very deliberately and says a lot about the modern media and the instrumental uses of both the internet but also the modern media. Um, professor, I just wanted to interject, we're, we're mm -hmm. waiting for the mic, uh, that there was a lot of disinformation about the cartoons as yes. well, that they were deliberately manipulated with even more vile uh, depictions right. um, that in fact had nothing to do, one of them at least, had nothing to do with Islam whatsoever. It was from a, a contest, a pig squealing contest in France, right. um, and so that it was stoked uh, okay. deliberately by some bad actors right. in this. My name is Max Singer. I was going to ask whether this uh, group of Muslims that you describe, uh, uh, moderate Muslims who have these to model their life after, or try to model their life, their life after the prophet, whether these people are uh, active or vocal uh, in uh, speaking against uh, Al-Qaeda and other uh, Muslim uh, leaders who, uh, who have a different view of, of Islam than they do. Yes, for sure I would argue that. Um, I'm talking about members of city councils in Europe, I'm talking about association leaders, uh, members of parliament, um, Nasser Qadr, who you uh, hosted here. Um, uh, it is, is last time I spoke to him, uh, considered himself a religious man, um, but uh, had no interest in, in uh, uh, squelching free speech. Um, if you read my book, you will see most of the people I interviewed said free speech is. Uh, the questions: Do they speak up against Al Qaeda? Oh, against Al Qaeda? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. Yes, against, against the Muslims yeah. who, yeah. who uh, encourage violence go against the, uh, their picture of, uh, of the prophet. Oh, yeah, for sure. I mean, the Egyptian government does that. I mean, Al-Qaeda is a plague on both houses. Can, can I add one thing on that? Um, I, I was um, born and grew up in Turkey, and, uh, um, you know, also, the books that you know we read about uh, Islam and and uh, Prophet's life are really highlighting the ethical principles. Mm -hmm. And Turkey is a secular um, uh, state, and um, and it's very important that uh, that religion and politics is, is kept separate, which is doesn't exist in many of the other um, countries. And um, and what. Uh, people are raised with in general, of course there's extremism everywhere, is really to highlight um, the 
um, loving and tolerant and spiritual aspect of, of the prophet and, and the religion because, I mean, um, as I said, that you can't force people to respect Islam. You can't force people to really uh, believe in, uh, in the faith. And, in, and uh, unlike what, um, what I started to um, see when I came to the U.S., um, most of the um, discussion about the Prophet's life, about Islam, is highlighting on the positive aspects in the general mainstream. But then you have the extremists who give a very, very different um, uh, lecture, and those are the ones that are doing most uh, damage because they say, no, actually the Prophet wasn't a peace, peaceful uh, man, that was Jesus, and, and Prophet was a military commander, he was doing this and he was doing that. And there's very little uh, debate or discussion among those groups, basically. They sort of stay out of each other's ways. If anything, the radical ones are, are trying to say, you know, um, why are you just remaining sort of peaceful in, in some ways when there's a war on Islam? And we need to come together and we need to stick together and, and defend Islam. And uh, so, so looking at, for example, the last um, 30 years or so, there's much more radicalism in the uh, Islamic uh, culture world than was before because the radicals have been much more successful in defining the understanding and interpretation of uh, Islamic history, Prophet's life, than the other way around, unfortunately. Hi, uh, my name is Ashlyn Hache. Um, I have a question about uh, your views on the idea of defamation of religions or religious figures being a human rights violation. Um, what do you think is the feasibility of it? Um, does a single individual need to consider a defamation to have occurred? Does it need to be a panel of experts on Islam to say that a defamation has occurred? Do you think that it will really contribute to the protection of, of people as the human rights regime claims to do? Or will it be counterproductive to a regime which is meant to provide sort of basic protection for people? I think this is a very complicated question and I don't have a ready-made answer. Uh, I have uh, thought about it for some time. Um, I do think that in the end, um, in a Western European context, um, and that's what really we are talking about, this is really not applicable in the United States where the First Amendment um, would, would prevent any sort of adjudication on such principles. Uh, in the European context, I think it's very problematic uh, to expect courts to be able to understand um, and argue uh, with uh, theologies outside Christianity. Uh, I don't really see any practical avenue for how a court can possibly work that out. Um, and as a consequence, a secular interpretation of the meaning of blasphemy really has become, in practice, one of a front to the group, not to the individual. So not you can't have an individual Christian saying, no, my rights were violated because uh, my God was defamed. But you can have a group of Christians, uh, a particular uh, community, a congregation, complain that they as a group have been, uh, and their understanding of, um, of Jesus, say, um, has been um, um, uh, mischaracterized in, at a level that constitutes an affront and therefore is actionable. Um, in reality, I think this is highly, highly problematic. And uh, uh, I, frankly, the uh, UN Human Rights Council's uh, embrace of, uh, of these sort of concepts it's just not going to be matched uh, with legal practice. Uh, legal practice is to eliminate all of these uh, sort of um, uh, uh, clauses. Um, then there's a substitution going on towards uh, 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 prohibition of um, in, uh, incitement to hatred or religious hatred. Uh, incitement, um, a racialist speech, and all of those sort of things. And there's just such a uh, so it's a broad umbrella of speech offenses, I think, that the European reaction, um, and certainly in the past 10 years, the tendency has been to ratchet, a uh, ratcheting up of these sort of speech offenses. But I think over the next 10 years, you will see that um, they're just all going to go away again. Uh, 
Uh, it's just not, it's, it's, uh, when you add them up and you try in a multi-religious pluralistic society to figure out an equitable way of enforcing such rules, it's really not possible without creating a very um, expanding restraint in speech very significantly. Thanks. Um, my name is Jasper Passing. I'm with the Danish Institute for International Studies. And this question is to Dr. Judith Clausen. Um, I'd like to touch a bit upon the country of Saudi Arabia that I haven't heard you mention uh, during mm -hmm. your presentation. And I would like to tap in where you m labeled uh, the reprinting of the cartoons in 2008 as sort of a mini crisis. Mm -hmm. uh, because one could also argue that what you in fact saw in 2008 was sort of a consolidation of what had been going on since 2006. So you could see the OIC reacting, you could see many other actors sort of reacting quicker than they did in 2006 and in a more consolidated manner. And one of these was, in fact, uh, an initiative by uh, King Abdullah of Saudi Arabia, who uh, since 2006 has appointed the Muslim World League to uh, appoint a subcommittee defending the Prophet internationally. And, and, and th this is what they do by order of the king. Uh, and at the same time, what they do is that they try to balance between uh, condemning terrorism, but defending uh, the honor of the prophet or you know, working against defamation of Islam. Mm -hmm. So my question to you, Dr. Mm -hmm. Clausen, would be uh, your comments to, should we say, the efforts of, of, of the House of Saud in trying to, at the same time, balancing between their alliance with the West, uh, discussing the issues between Islam and the Western world as they are currently, and at the same time trying to speak up against, should we call the, the true extremists, Al-Qaeda and their affiliates, uh, radical extremists. Um, yes, thank you. I recognize a fellow Dane when I <laughs> see one. Um, uh, Saudi Arabia was not uh, a primary actor in the inception of the conflict. It was really Turkey and Egypt um, acting through the Arab League and the Organization of the Islamic Conference um, that drove the first period of the Khartoum conflict. Nor was Iran particularly important. Iran sort of created its own sideshow, a Medina Jat called for a counter competition, cartoonism, um, which actually turned out to be a complete flop. Um, the, um, what I think what you're describing is correct, but what happened was that once um, uh, the um, Organization of the Islamic Conference had in December 2005 its meeting in Mecca, uh, the religious authorities were brought in and all this whole infrastructure, including the Committee to Defend uh, the Prophet, was created. Uh, the, uh, the Saudi Arabian Committee then funded many of the lawsuits on blasphemy grounds in Europe that were subsequent, that, that followed throughout the, uh, well, they're still running actually, there still is a complaint um, before the European Court of Human Rights. Uh, and uh, uh, I, it, it was a, an interesting, interesting phenomenon, but uh, certainly in, in Cairo when I was visiting there and talking to people, uh, many Egyptian uh, political scientists thought that uh, this was the Khartoum crisis was a perfect conflict for the Egyptians, um, in part because it was about the love of the prophet. It was the prophet who was defamed, but it was a much uh, so. This was about Islam as, as love, and um, it was much more difficult conflict for for Saudi Arabia to get engaged in, and Saudi Arabia was instrumental. Uh, a little later, um, uh, at the time of starting the uh, trade boycott. Um, but now all of this has been in institutionalized. So of course, uh, there are now a much quicker turnover time and something happens and immediately uh, this whole diplomatic apparatus kicks in. And that is one of the legacies of the conflict that we now have this mm -hmm. um, instant response. Um, uh, apparatus uh, and it's, uh, Western uh, European governments have have you know uh, strategic planning sessions about how to deal with um, these sort of instances such as what just happened with my book or some artist who puts up a bad picture or something. Well, uh, I want to th thank our speaker uh, very much. This brings us to the end of our program today, and uh, I want to thank Yeta Klassen for. Uh, visiting with us and, and being the first to uh, audience to 
hear about her own reflections on writing the book and since its publication. And I want to thank Zeno Baran uh, for moderating, and thank you all for coming. Thank you. Ute Clausen is a comparative politics professor at Brandeis University. She's the author of The Islamic Challenge, Politics and Religion in Western Europe, 1945 to the Present. For more information, visit brandeis.edu.